have killed some nice bucks, but it's the method of the hunt that gets me. That's the part that really tickles my funny bone. They don't realize that they're not drawing the bow as far as they think they are. Everybody thinks they're drawing a 28 inch draw and most people are, you know, drawing significantly less. Big game changer, you start throwing a stone point on there and a primitive string and, and everybody says, oh, it does exactly the same. There's no difference and it's, there's a night and day difference to it. Uh, a lot of the young ones in the new woke culture, you know, are like you're stealing and this is racist and it's like it's actually the opposite of racist. I never want to be the type that says well, I'm going to be the next Fred Bear because there's only one of those. I don't want to be the next Fred Bear. I just want to be the first Ryan Gill. This is Ryan Gill from Hunt Primitive and you're listening to The Wild Initiative. Put down your latte and pull on your boots. I would rest at peace for eternity if my legacy was that I made a positive influence on the non-hunting public about what hunters are and what hunting is. I finally got my buck on our last real day of hunting. So a pro-hunting organization is voting against hunting. And that says anti-hunting to me. There was a year straight where I was averaging up to 200 death threats a day. And I hugged it. Like, I just wanted to hug a bear. It's proven that the average steak in a grocery store touches 50 to 100 hands and machines. And we're putting that into our body. Hey, y'all, Cable Smith, host of the Lone Star Outdoors show here. This is Adam Weatherby. I'm Corey Jacobson with Elk 101. This is Christy Titus. Hey, folks, this is John Bear. You're listening to The Wild Initiative. Hey y'all, welcome to another episode of The Wild Initiative, brought to you as part of the Waypoint Podcast Network. All right, y'all, so hopping into it today, I have a very interesting guest for y'all, Ryan Gill. You may know him on Instagram as Hunt Primitive. Um, This is something I've always found fascinating is is just taking it way back. I have a love of bow hunting, but let's face it, I have a love of bow hunting with something with wheels and multiple strings and a sight and all of that. And so the idea of not only trad hunting, but then primitive hunting has always been fascinating to me. So Ryan, I really appreciate you taking the time hopping on and looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, sure thing. Glad to talk with you. So just to kick things off, I'd love it if, uh, if you could really give folks an introduction about who you are, but mostly how were you introduced to the outdoors and hunting? And then how did that turn into primitive uh, archery and primitive hunting? Well, I suppose that I've been doing this ever since I can remember. I mean, just a little kid just playing with homemade bows and arrows in the backyard, like most kids do, you know, you go out and cutting sticks and bending them and shooting dog fennel arrows and uh, trial and error through all of that and splitting the arrows with the string and learning to tie dental floss around them, you know, and it's just organically starting to figure that stuff out. So certainly couldn't put a date to it, but my dad, uh, loved hunting and thought it was incredibly important to teach me everything that he knew about just an outdoor lifestyle. And I don't really know why it's just the way that it worked out and I'm very grateful for it. But there's probably that just that one thing in your life, and this is this would really go for anybody, but there's one thing in your life that puts you in that spiritual zone. You know what I mean? It's that you might be good at a lot of things. You might enjoy a lot of things, but there's that one thing that you just know that this is what you were made to do. And growing up, as much as I tinkered with all other kind of things, uh, everything from, you know, race cars and, and taxidermy to, I mean, the list really would go on ridiculously far. I just love to <laughs> monkey around with stuff that I get into and probably shouldn't. Uh, the one thing that always... I really did it for me was hunting in one fashion or another. And we didn't have really any land to hunt per se. We would take trips to go places and uh, that was, we would hunt public land locally. And I mean, I was pretty darn young and my dad was, was taking me out. And I remember he, uh, he jumped uh, an armadillo in small game season and shot it with a shotgun as it kind of ran away. And I probably sat there with a Red Rider BB gun and ran through every BB in it as I just sat there and shot the the belly of this armadillo over and over and over uh, and just bouncing BBs off of it just because it just... I can't, I just felt like the right thing to do. And he just sat and let me do it until I said I was done. (laughs) And, and, uh, you know, and then the next time I remember wanting to bring a, uh, a bow and arrow out, it was was probably like 
it was probably within a month. I don't, I couldn't give you any timeline. I was very young. Like I would say, let's say five, you know, kindergarten ish, you know, range when this was going on, we went out and they, uh, there was, we found another armadillo and it was over a stump and I snuck straight up to it, leaned over the stump and actually shot it with, uh, with an arrow. And I was, had one of those little, like old green fiberglass bows and, uh, it had an aluminum arrow and you know how the, when you're having aluminum arrow and the point's not screwed in all the way, <laughs> that is, it's got a very specific kind of sound yeah, to it. Yeah. I can still hear that in my head when I hit the shell of that armadillo and that arrow bounced back and made that rattle and sound. <laughs> and it was, I think from that's probably the earliest bow hunting memory I have. And from then it was like, well, shoot, uh, this, this seems great. And of course, growing up, we hunted with rifles and everything else, you know, until I got to where I'd killed several animals and shot a wild hog when I was age seven, um, killed my first deer at age eight, killed a buck at age 10. And just, you know, just kind of consistently shot stuff first bow kill was with a compound uh, and i was 10 years old and shot a hog and then it's like i got into high school and uh was a little bit more focused on chasing two-legged deer instead of four-legged deer <laughs> and actually kind of let go of it for a little bit we just hunted you know a couple times a year if we went out but you know as i found uh, the woman that's now my wife i really got back into it heavy and really been after it hardcore since then but that's it can go back to that earliest memory of this is where i felt the most at home you know i feel like for a lot of people that hunt whatever their story is uh you know like for me i'm an adult onset hunter i didn't pick it up until i was well into my 30s and uh but i feel like there's you can always look back and kind of find some moment that kind of hints at that you were going to end up here. And I mean, it's not a hundred percent, but like I look back in and same kind of thing. Like I, you know, I had a BB gun growing up and I had a fiberglass youth bow. Mine was like a neon high vis yellow. Um, and, uh, but I remember I would sit in the backyard and, you know, we had a, a big old cinder block like shed and I would put, you know, some plywood up behind, uh, leaned up against it and then stack my targets to it. And I'd pump that thing up and I'd be shooting and then I'd wait till my mom was kind of, we had, you know, my mom would be in the kitchen window watching me and I'd kind of wait till my mom got a little distracted. Then I'd angle it up and I'd see all the pigeons on the neighbor's roof <laughs> or on the power lines, you know, going over the house. And I would just plug them, plug them, plug them until my mom would see me and catch me and say, what are you doing? <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, I'm back to the target. Sorry. I was just you know, looking, whatever. And it was, you know, I, I think about that and I'm like, yeah, that was like the first sign. Like they feel like hunting's in all of us for sure. And, but everyone does have that Zen thing, whether it's hunting, whether it's surfing or painting or this or that, you know, it's um, finding that moment, I think, or that, uh, that spiritual thing for each and every one of us is, is kind of critical in your life. It's when you start kind of, you're like, this is what I was put on the earth to do. And it's an mm -hmm. amazing feeling when you figure that out. Absolutely. And I think that people have, uh, they either have the hunting in them or they don't. And I don't think that it's as much of a spectrum to where, you know, you have a little bit, I think it's kind of black or white. You're either a hunter or you're not a hunter. And I'm, a, you know, I'm one of the believers that we carry a, a tremendous amount of uh, genetic traits, you know, back from the stone age. And so to me, it's, there's, there's a visceral uh, sort of feeling about it. When you, when you are destined to hunt, you hunt and it's, there's almost no stopping you. Um, even if you're late to the game in it, it's like you were still hunting birds when you were a kid or, you know, even chasing around grasshoppers and trying to whack them with a stick. You know, there's just something in us that is innate that says we have to go out and kill animals, but that stems from this is how we get our food. And uh, some people have that and some people don't. I really believe that there's a, there's a hunter lifestyle and then there's the, uh, the farmer, you know, horticulturist that you're kind of one or the other. And then you know, there's obviously people that grow gardens and are, you know, and hunt and that kind of stuff. But typically you'll notice like your farmers, like hardcore ranch, you know, farmers don't usually hunt or, you know, they're too busy 
growing food. And it's like, it's kind of black and white. There's obviously a little bit of mix in there, but I don't think it's a, it's a, uh, a consistent spectrum. I think it's pretty black and white overall. You're either a hunter or you're not. Yeah. So, you know, you were hunting, you were hunting with rifles and, and compound bows and chasing deer and this and that. That's a pretty big leap then to, you know, flint napping your own broadheads and, and, you know, shooting with effectively a stick and a string. Um, you know, what, uh, what inspired that transition? The challenge for sure. Uh, didn't seem that there was a lot of challenge in it anymore. And I guess that kind of sounds egotistical in a way, but it's <laughs> like, that's, uh, I could go out with a rifle and, it's we're going to come home with something and to a lot of people that's enough and they're very happy to do it the end of the game is they just want to go and get something and i kept remembering what it was like to shoot my you know my first you know deer you know even the first deer with a bow and i love that feeling and i want to get that feeling back and after just shooting so much stuff that feeling just kind of left it was just another day at the office is what it kind of felt like and so the the primitive route really brought that back and actually it's not even escaped me yet so even when i go out and shoot something now i still get elated over it where i still and i hunt with uh, i don't hunt with really any modern rifles i haven't done that for years and i don't own a compound bow but as modern as i get is a flintlock now and the only reason i hunt with the flintlock is because when we have a muzzleloader quota hunt on public land uh it's muzzleloader only and so I'm like, well, I'm going to get, you know, about the most primitive muzzleloader I can get short of, you know, a match lock or a wheel lock. And I thought about, thought about doing a match lock and I could just see me trying to flint and steal a, uh, you know, carry an ember around until I see an animal and then light the, <laughs> light the wick on it and dip it and shoot it. And I thought, man, that would be a lot of fun, but I'm not passionate enough about it to do it. Flint locks. Great. Still love the flint lock, you know? <laughs> um, but even now it's amazing ever since hunting with the flint lock, even on three day quota hunts, because that's what a lot of our pu- public land hunts are here. You get like three days and that's it, you know, in like a muzzleloader hunt or five days, some are five day hunts. So whenever I've pulled one, almost every single year within three days, I've killed something with a flintlock. It's like if I see an animal that it's and it's a legal animal to shoot, there's a very good chance it's going to die. And so it, that's kind of now when I do shoot something with a flintlock, it's not as exciting to me. It's almost more like this was a meat hunt sort of thing. Like actually specifically what's today, today's Thursday. I shot a hog Sunday with the Flint lock. That was my quota. And uh, a buddy of mine, Jim Desias was up hunting with me because we'll trade off on the uh, quotas. You're allowed to bring a buddy. And so if he draws it, he'll bring me as a buddy. If I draw it, I'll bring him as a buddy. And so it kind of works out. It's a good opportunity for us to hunt together. So he came up and, uh, a deer came out and it's a spike and we're not allowed to shoot spikes. And I had it like 16 yards broadside. I'm just wanting meat. So about this time I'm furious because that's the best taste in deer that there is out there. And I'm not allowed to shoot the dang thing. And, uh, and I really, I didn't even want a hog, but how do you just pass up a hog on public land, you know, on a three day quota. And it was Sunday, the last day and shot it. And, uh, you know, it's just all kind of a little anticlimactic, you know, and Mm -hmm. it's a little bit sad to look at it like that. But to me, that's how it turned. That's like how all hunting has been for me aside from the primitive hunting. And I've never lost that, that real excitement when I run a stone pointed cane shaft through something and I know I made a beautiful shot and then it runs over about 40 yards and either does donuts or flops over or something. And I got it, man, there's, there's just no better feeling than that, but I can't reproduce that even with a flintlock, you know, let alone, uh, you know, and it doesn't matter to me if it's a giant buck or not, that doesn't get me excited and i know you've heard a lot of people say that oh i don't care about antlers and then they're always like yeah well wait till you got a big one in front of you and now all of a sudden you do care you know and Mm -hmm. and uh and i'm just genuinely not interested like i've killed some nice bucks but it's the method of the hunt that gets me that's the part that really tickles my funny bone and i have to 
enjoy the method of the hunt so much more. It's not the size. I will shoot the first 30 pound pig that rocks in front of me. I will shoot the first button buck and be glad, happy to do it. Every button buck is a trophy when you shoot it with a stick bow stone point and a cane arrow. And you can't really say that about anything else. You know, it's, it's the difference between like, okay, yeah, I'm going grocery shopping versus I'm doing something I'm passionate about. Like, you know, you take that Flint lock out, you're like you said, you're filling the freezer. It's like, it's a, I don't even want to say it's a chore, but it's something you're check kind of almost checking off the list. It's like, okay. Yeah, I, was like, I was like, now I have to, now I got to take this thing home and clean it. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a family event to go to in about two hours. So I was slightly annoyed that it was like, now I got to hurry up and do this. I get this thing in the cooler. <laughs> and then, well, you know, while we were there, you know, I was with my buddy, Jim, I was, I even told him, I was like, I wish you would have just shot this thing. You know, I was like, you can just take it home with you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I could have sent it home with him anyway, but he's had a good year. So I figured I should probably just keep it myself. But, uh, yeah, it was like, I kept telling him, man, I wish, I wish you were here with me. I would have just told you to shoot it, you know, cause that's, you know, now for primitive hunting or whatever, it's like, I, I'm, I'm wanting to pull a string on something. I get excited about that, but the flintlock stuff, you know, yeah. so that's as modern as I get, but that's just going through the motions. That's a, that's a meat hunt. A chance well, to be in the woods. And, you know, I'm kind of, I have a similar mindset in the way that I like challenging myself more and more every time. And I, I at the moment, you know, and I'm sure it'll change as I, I become more experienced and a better hunter. Um, but at the moment I'm kind of in the phase of like, as long as it's, I learn something and it's, I, I, I should say, I care about antlers to the extent of, I want something more challenging than the last time. I want an older buck, a bigger buck. So that's kind of my rule is I just, I just have to shoot something a little bit bigger than the last one because it's, you know, or a little bit older than the last one, a little bit more of something because it's then, you know, challenging my skills a little bit more, giving me that extra challenge. Cause I'm not even close to the point of a, <laughs> of a trad bow or a, a primitive bow. Um, you know, a, a compound, you know, at 60 yards is still more than enough, more than enough challenge for me. Um, but you know, I've, I've taken one mule deer and I've taken an elk. And so I'm like, okay, this is what I got. I got a, a nice little spike mule deer. So if the next one I get is a taller spike or maybe a forky, hell yeah, that's awesome. If the next one I get a, a big old, I've seen some beefy whitetails on my property recently. Um, if the next one I get is a big old beefy whitetail, awesome. Even better. You know, I'll stick the head on the wall and call it, you know, and eat mm -hmm. the hell out of it. I love it. Um, but as long as it's, I'm, I'm always challenging myself. That's what kind of makes me happy with it. And I feel like that's kind of where you're coming at with the trad bows. It's always a challenge for you. It's always testing you a little bit more. And I think, you know, as guys, we're men, you know, we like to be challenged. We're, we feel more satisfied when we're being challenged by something. We have a problem to solve or whatever it is. You know, I feel like that brings a lot of satisfaction into our lives. Yeah. You know, I, I think it is progressive because when I was younger and was, you know, growing up hunting, I wanted to shoot, you know, a big buck kind of stuff too. Yeah, about like everybody. That's just the way it works. You know, you, you do, you, you want to shoot one and then you say you hold out for and shoot the next one. Or if it's public land, you're happy to get about anything. But, <laughs> um, you know, I specifically remember going, you know, I, I want an eight point and that's what it had to be, you know, at some points, so I'm not going to shoot something unless it's an eight point, you know? And I remember letting bucks go by, you know, when I was, uh, you know, a kid hunting with a rifle because I wanted a bigger buck. And I think once you've got to that point where you feel like you've killed enough and it's not, you know, and you've killed enough bigger bucks. And I'm not saying like giants. We don't have like giants here in Florida. But I guess because I had killed probably some of the biggest deer I figured I would ever kill in Florida, it's like I could hunt for years and years and probably never kill a bigger one. And that gave me the opportunity to devote to the bow hunt to say, well, now I've got the challenge, but I can basically kill anything that comes by and still be extremely happy with it. You know, like I would, I legitimately, people think I'm, you know, lying when I say this or exaggerating on it. And it's not the case at all, but I would sh rather shoot a button buck with my primitive bow, cane arrow, stone point, than shoot a 180 inch deer with a rifle, like hands down, no question. 
and I will stand by that forever. Put, you know, staple my name right to it and sign it. Um, I, the antlers don't do it for me like they used to, because I think I've gone through that progression and I've seen Mm -hmm. enough nice bucks. I've killed enough nice bucks. My dad did a lot of family has, and what I can extract out of a primitive hunt, I've never been able to replicate any other way. And of course I got started, you know, fairly young with the primitive hunting, um, compared to where most people are just getting started with other hunting, you know, I've already moved on and started my primitive journey, which was in my late teens, you know, early twenties and almost gave up completely on the, uh, the modern equipment by that point. So I've got a little bit of a head start, And I think that when people say, well, you know, primitive hunting is fine, but I actually want to kill, you know, animals or something like that. <laughs> um, I get where they're coming from, or they just want to hunt big bucks. I totally get that. It's when you finally eclipse that stage of your life and say, now I'm looking for something else. That's, and there's not a lot of people that do that. So that's why you have less people that shoot trad and even less people that shoot primitive. And then a very, very few amount of people that dip even into the atlatl to say, yeah, I'm going to go out with literally throwing a stick with a rock on the end of it. And I'm going to try to kill something with this. And then you, I mean, you think about all the opportunities on animals that I've missed out on because I'm hunting with something primitive, you know, where especially when I'm hunting with the hat ladle <laughs> and, and how many opportunities where I've been like, could have killed that one with a bow. No problem. Like, you know, you go through a whole bunch of those until you finally get it. But then when you eclipse it and you kill that one with an atlatl, you're like, that's where it's at. And then of course I always take it, you know, three steps harder than it needs to be because that's what the new excitement is. I'm always trying to find a way to make it more exciting, but, uh, it's not even, I I don't even want to hunt a tree stand anymore. I haven't hunted in a tree stand for several years now it's spot and stock and if that means i shoot less animals that's okay so i've killed 47 big game animals with primitive hunting equipment right now and if i was shooting modern stuff i mean it would be in the hundreds you know because i miss opportunities all the time and i'm okay with that if i didn't monkey around with the atlatls and even stuff like that makes it even more difficult like sinew bow strings um you know in the complete primitive arrow setups, you know, or stuff Mm -hmm. that's made with stone age tools, as opposed to the modern stuff. If I didn't monkey around with that, I would have even more kills, but it's not, you start, that's why I had to realize it's not the kill. That's the important part. It's not the, um, the kill is important. Don't get me wrong. If there's no purpose to it, I'm not going to be out there. So it is important that I shoot something. Everybody says, well, just a good day in the woods is better than, you know, being at home or whatever. And it's like, I like being at home and I love my shop. So if I'm out <laughs> the woods, I'm out to try to kill stuff. You know, I love, I love working. I love what I do because I do this for a living. So I absolutely love it. But the, the number one goal is to get out in the woods and, and kill something. But ultimately, the bow and arrow or the atlatl or whatever I'm hunting with is ultimately more important than the animal itself. If that makes sense. No, that makes a ton of sense. And the atlatl, I just, it's like the concept of it. If you state it plainly, you're effectively hunting with two sticks on a rock. Like it's yeah. just, it's wild. Um, but you know, you talked about, you killed 40, three, seven, 47, 47. Yep with primitive equipment you kind of you you kind of started jumping into it with some stuff because i feel like there's a wide variety of what could be considered primitive and i mean and you can come at this from a hundred different angles i'm sure whether it's you know uh, stone age versus like what uh, say native tribes would use versus i mean some people would consider just a modern trad bow primitive hunting um right so i guess my question would be like, first of all, like what would be the difference say between trad and primitive? And then how would you personally define like for your own definition of what primitive is? Yeah, it's definitely an individual's opinion on that. Cause everybody has a, a different line that they draw. Oh, and everyone, so not, he, everyone yeah, has I'm, an opinion in the hunting industry about stuff. Really? <laughs> yeah. I've never noticed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so for me now that's, that's evolved for me too. remember, because I've been doing it so long. So what I used to say was primitive. Now I look at and I say, it's not primitive. Um, 
I also include some of those 47 in some of my earlier hunts is I was shooting a bow that I made myself and an arrow that I made myself. And I've killed two, two animals with commercial glue on broadheads. So I include those in there because it was very early in my journey. Um, so that was exceptionally primitive for me at the time, but it was still a homemade bow. I made it myself out of a stave and I made the arrows myself. I just used a glue on broadhead. So once I got a little confidence with that, then I made my own broadhead. So I hammered flat a spoon and I cut it out and I sharpened it and I killed, I've killed, let's see, one, two, three, I think just three, three deer with spoon points three or four. I don't remember. Hard to say. Um, <laughs> and that I very much considered primitive because I still, then I made the point myself and, uh, you know, then I've been on the stone really ever since I've never looked back. And, uh, now it's evolved to where primitive to me is becoming even more so like ultra primitive. It's, you can't shoot in a modern bowstring. You know, that's that's where I draw my own personal line. I don't judge anybody else for doing it because for years I shot a B-50 Dacron string because the your bowstring is actually one of the most difficult things to make uh, from natural materials. I mean, it's under a tremendous amount of tension. And so most primitive strings don't hold up and you have to really uh, marry yourself to wanting to do that. And not only that, but the performance difference between a primitive string and a modern string is it's incredible. There's a, there's, uh, like a threshold of failure for a bow to be able to deliver an arrow with enough energy to kill an animal. And once you fall below that, that's when you start getting the lack of penetration or no penetration at all, you know, and bounces off of animals. And I've heard lots of stories of that. And in the early years, I've bounced two uh, arrows off of deer before. So I know what that feels like and uh, you say well what nerf could have gone wrong and it's like well everything you know everything <laughs> yeah everything it's incredibly underpowered and now when you in even if you're shooting modern strings and you're shooting deer all the time and you're shooting through them you've got it figured out you go to a primitive string it's like you just lost 10 feet per second and that can put you under the the threshold of failure so now instead of shooting 150 feet per second you're shooting 140 feet per second and then when you start getting on the really technical side and start this is stuff that i'm working on writing for my book that i can put a ton of data down for people so they can actually mm -hmm. go straight to it reference it and say your 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 bow needs to shoot you know this grain arrow at this fps to be able to you know efficiently penetrate and then this is what the characteristics of the arrow need to have to be able to do this very very intensive book but this is stuff that it's taken me now years and years and years to figure out so now when i look at people that are shooting say uh, self bow that, and this isn't to knock anybody at all. Cause I did the same thing and I still consider them all in my primitive hunts as should they, it's just my line. I, the bar yeah. starts getting a little higher for myself all the time. I'm hard on myself. Um, but now when I look at, if I make a bow and it's got an arrow shelf on it and I'm shooting a fast flight string or a B 50 string, you know, and you've got like a, a doweled, you know, cedar or fir shaft. And then, you know, a shoot, there's even guys that are shooting carbons off of them and then they'll make screw in stone points, you know, and to me, none of that's <laughs> primitive at all. It's out of context, you know? Uh, but if that's what does it for you, then that's what does it for you. You know, I'm not going to tell anybody they shouldn't do that. I wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole personally, because it's just way too far out of context. But, you know, nowadays it's like, I don't even want to shoot a modern bowstring. I want to shoot a sinew bowstring that I twisted up out of deer tendons and, uh, you know, a wooden bow that doesn't have anything on it that's modern with the exception of if I want to class it up a little bit and put some snakeskins on it, you know, I'll use modern glue to glue the snakeskins on, you know, tight bond wood glue and doesn't add any strength or durability to the bow whatsoever. It's just a look, you know, and it might take some acrylic paints and do some dot work on it and that kind of stuff. It doesn't affect the performance of the bow in the least. It's just to dress it up but yeah nowadays it's like cane arrow or hardwood shaft arrow that you got in the woods you actually cut the shaft yourself make a bow out of a piece of wood not a board you know no milled lumber anything like that primitive bow string uh stone point that's not made from you know a cut and ground slab you know where they cut it into shape and then you chip the edges you got to start with a raw you know rock and break it and work it down into the point and then you got to haft it you know with uh 
you know, traditional pine pitch or hide glue or something and wrap it with sinew. So I just keep making it more and more difficult and it probably aggravates people because then they <laughs> keep saying, well, I, you know, all this stuff you say is not primitive and, and I'm shooting it and now I'm mad at you because you said it wasn't <laughs> primitive. And I only, you know, again, back that up with, remember I did that stuff too. And I did consider it primitive and I add those into my primitive kill because I've killed a lot of deer and hogs, um, you know, with, Dacron bowstrings, and I still consider those primitive. It's just progressional. Well, you know, you're just out here carelessly hurting people's feelings, Ryan. You know, it's just <laughs> yeah, terrible happens. of you. But no, I mean, it's it makes a lot of sense because it's all about that progression that we discussed. It's not, you know, it's your mindset's changing. It, you know, it doesn't. It's it's the what you're doing compared to your level of skill, I should say. So whether that is yeah, trying to hunt a big elk or a big deer with a rifle for somebody that's never done that before, that's going to be a high level of difficulty for them and oh, yeah. a high challenge for, you know, someone like yourself, you know, shooting a compound bow is kind of like, ugh. you know, it's like, OK, I've done it. There's no there's no challenge to that anymore. Yeah, it's maybe more challenging than, say, a rifle hunt, but yeah, being able to build all of that and adding that complexity and having that challenge of fine tuning things. Cause I mean, like you said, it, you know, you're switching from what, what kind of performance difference are we talking uh, even on a trad bow? Cause I'm sure people out there are like, whatever it's a strings, a string, it goes on a bow. It's yeah, not even close. Yeah. So what kind of performance difference are we talking about shooting like a, a, a produced trad bow string or whatever, or a uh, tr- produced bowstring Dacron, I think is what you said. Yeah. Uh, you know, versus a twisted sinew string. What kind of performance difference are we looking at? If you're talking about just like the same bow across the board. So if you're, if you're talking, say like an Osage self bow or Hickory self bow or whatever, uh, I've actually done a lot of tests on this for the book. And of course it varies in and out a little bit, but on average, and it's a, it's a safe average to say you're looking at an eight to 10 feet per second difference between like, say a sinew string and a Dacron string. Oh, wow. And then on the same bow, about another eight to 10 feet per second difference between a Dacron string and say a fast flight string. And so now when you're talking about modern fiberglass bows as well, that are more efficient, you know, normal everyday trad bows, you know, glued up with, you know, the industrial epoxy and all that kind of stuff. Those bows, most guys are shooting between like 160 to, you know, 190 feet per second, sometimes even a little bit more, depending on their weight and their draw length and all that kind of stuff. But you can make those bows cook. You really can, especially if you've got a longer draw length and, uh, you know, in a glass bow and you're shooting a fast flight string or an 8125 string, you're, uh, you can get up close to 200 or even over 200 really without an issue. Not a problem at all whatsoever. Your average, they always say if you've got a decent, like a decent average self bow, if it shoots a um, hundred feet per second over its draw length or draw weight, sorry, not draw length, draw weight. So say if you have a uh, 55 pound bow, your, your bow is doing pretty good to shoot 155 feet per second. Now that's just a, a generic idea that somebody came up with. I have no clue who said that, but guaranteed it was based on a more modern string, like a Dacron string. Those like ideas that were probably introduced more so in the eighties or nineties. Maybe somebody listening to this even knows where that, uh, whole idea came from. And I would stand with that for the most part. That's what I've seen is, uh, and of course that's based on a 10 grain, uh, per pound arrow as well. So, you know, 50 pound bow, 500 grain arrow shooting 150 feet per second is just decently average. And that's of course with the more modern string. But what I've noticed is once you start introducing stuff like stone points, even when they're extremely well-made and they're very sharp, and the tip geometry and the edge geometry is optimized, it takes a lot more force to shove that piece of stone through than it does a piece of steel um, or, you know, stone broadhead versus steel broadhead. And there's been some rudimentary tests people have done and say, no, no, it's exactly the same. And I'm like, absolutely not. I've seen it 
firsthand over and over and over, you have to have extra energy to deliver it because there's a threshold of failure. There's a point where you're going to shoot an arrow slow enough that the steel point will still go, still go into it and kill the animal, but the stone point will not. And that's what's important is to find that threshold of failure. Well, unfortunately, what happens is you start shooting a real primitive bow that's made out of a single piece of wood, especially if it's in a high humidity climate and humidity makes the feet per second of the bow drop down significantly. Now throw on a primitive bowstring. There's a lot of people that when they shoot through a chronograph, their feelings get really hurt. <laughs> um, I've seen that a lot where, you know, people are like, ah, my bow's great. You know, I don't have any worries on this. And they're shooting, you know, 105 to 120 feet per second. And to me, that's below the threshold of failure, or it's just enough. They're going to poke into something and kill it, but there's times that they may not. And in my opinion, you need to be really around the 150 feet per second mark to be consistently uh, deadly with it, really efficient. Uh, and then down to 140 is kind of okay. You start getting below 140, I really don't want to touch it personally. Now, can you kill something with shooting less? Of course you can. Um, but you start hitting that threshold of failure, that 140 range, when you start shooting wooden bows with primitive strings. And so that's like the new big hurdle for a lot of people is they don't realize that they're not drawing the bow as far as they think they are. Everybody thinks they're drawing a 28 inch draw and most people are, you know, drawing significantly less. And uh, when I've given people actual tests, mark an arrow, shoot it without trying to just shoot absolutely natural and have somebody else watch. Don't try to pull back you know, and hold a draw length. Cause you shoot totally different when you do that. Mm -hmm. If you just pick it up and you shoot naturally, they'd be like, yeah, I've got like a 26 inch draw and they're shooting naturally. Very surprised to find, come to find out they're only drawing that bow 21 inches before they let it go. Now that the distance that you draw greatly impacts the speed, actually more so than the weight of the bow. So the further you draw the bow, the more energy you're going to be able to transfer into that arrow. So it gives you a lot better of power stroke into it. So now couple the idea that somebody thinks they've got a 60 pound bow and they're at 28 inches. Now they're actually <laughs> only drawing 23 inches and they're down into the low forties. And then they have a, if they have a primitive bow string on it, they could get down in, into the, you know, one tens, one fifteens and not kill a deer. And so it's like, I'm constantly troubleshooting people that say, Hey, I didn't get any penetration on a deer. What, what happened? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, cool. Mm -hmm. One of about 60 things that I can come up with could be the problem. So let's go through it and troubleshoot it out. And then it's typically a draw length issue, but most people don't shoot primitive strings, but that is a, and realistically yeah. for that reason, you know, with Dacron, you can get away with a little bit more because that's 10 feet per second faster than you're shooting with the other stuff. So it's, you know, if you're under drawing and then if you're shooting steel points, that threshold for failure is way lower. Yeah. You shoot a primitive, or I'm sorry, uh, you know, even a, a primitive self bow, an Osage self bow, hickory self bow with a modern string and a steel point. Now you can, you can penetrate and kill an animal down about what, hundred feet per second, probably like really yeah. low. I've seen people shoot completely through deer at 130 feet per second. And so, uh, yeah, big game changer. You start throwing a stone point on there and a primitive string and, and everybody says, all oh, it does exactly the same. There's no difference. And it's, there's a night and day difference to it. So, <laughs> and that's just, you know, ways that I up the bar. <laughs> that, that draw length issue is interesting. Cause I feel like that could also be something, uh, run into by a, a lot of guys that are like, yeah, I've been shooting compound my whole life. Uh, I want to switch to trad or switch to primitive um, because, you know, I mean, you know how it is on a compound, you set your draw length, you pull back, you feel that back wall, you feel your, your let off click in, you're holding that. Like it's, it's very intentional where you can yeah. feel it versus like you said, on a, on a trad bow, it, especially like doing something more like instinctive shooting. It's not like you're drawing back as far and like locking into place and holding and aiming and this whole thing to where you feel kind of the, the backside of that as much. Um, I can imagine that's probably a problem you run into with a lot of guys that have been shooting compound for a long time. Yeah. And I mean, there's even, uh, you know, traditional archers now that really focus on that locking in, um, you know, back alignment and all kinds, you know, really traditional form shooting, you know, like Clay Hayes, for example, is a, is a great example of that. I mean, he's far more 
of a traditional style, style shooter than a primitive style shooter. And he shoots more of a tradition or of a primitive bow, you know, shoot a, a, a wooden bow, you know, with the modern string and that. So because he just loves bow building, I don't think he's, um, in love necessarily with the self bow, you know, just because it's a self bow or because it's primitive, I think he loves it because he makes it. And that's just where his passion is. And he loves that, but he shoots it in a very traditional style. And so that gives him absolutely an edge over so many people, because not only does it give him an edge within his accuracy, but his power strokes incredibly long. Um, I think he shoots about 29 inches or so, which your average person that shoots like a more primitive style, like a snap shoot, uh, typically they sh shoot 25 inches and less. And that, you know, really reduces your power stroke and the amount of energy. I mean, you have to end up shooting very short bows to try to get the power stroke. But at the end of the day, 29 inches of power stroke versus 23 inches is a lot of difference. You know, mm -hmm. there's, you know, you can get to where there's not just 10 feet per second, there's 20 or 30 feet per second difference. So like for me personally, like build bows that I build for customers all the time, I've got a lot of customers that shoot like him. And so I build bows for a whole range of people, anywhere out to 32, 33 inch draw. And so I've tested a lot of these bows, shoot them through a chronograph. And if you take, you know, some of these all wooden bows and now you throw a fast flight string on it uh, and you're shooting a 28, 29 inch draw, well, we sling and, you know, arrows 190 feet per second with those. So, you know, it's just, it's more in the realm of the traditional aspect of it, but that's not how most primitive people shoot and that's not how uh most likely contextual early man shot most of their bows honestly probably would have broke until they uh got to a point much later in life say through the mississippi and area era where they were uh, a lot better bow builders some of the very earliest bows would have been saplings and sh very very short draw because they didn't know how to make a bow initially nobody knows how to do anything when they first you know start doing it they can draw a very long distance and uh so old habits i mean if you hand somebody a bow that's never shot a bow before they're not gonna and you, they've never shot a compound never shot anything you hand them a bow they're gonna short draw that thing like crazy they barely <laughs> pull it to the front of their face you know they may only pull that bow you know 10 inches back I was so. going to say, it feels like they probably, you probably shoot like you see in a lot of the old movies where they hold it right out in front of them, kind of exactly. almost pull back to their <laughs> chest and like let go. Uh -huh. um, yeah. <laughs> yep. And I, I imagine, you know, with, you know, again, this lower, uh, lower FPS and, and everything. I, I mean, we talked about it. Everything else to do with the bow has to be more tuned and more adjusted uh, more refined, like I can imagine broadhead size is a huge thing. Arrow weight. Um, do you, I mean, I think it, 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 it almost feels counterintuitive, but I'd assume you probably what shoot a heavier arrow with a, a primitive bow or am I completely off base on that? Well, that's been the idea for a long time, especially since the, the Dr. Ashby reports, you know, so everybody jumps onto that and they, they automatically apply that to primitive. And, and I've seen this now, more times than I can count where somebody says, well, I want to go on a moose or an elk hunt. So I need like a 300 grain stone point out front. Well, that's massive because stone is way less dense than steel. So mm -hmm. a, a 300 grain steel points, you know, a pretty big point, but you put a, a 300 grain stone point on there, you're shooting a knife. And they say, well, it doesn't matter because it's got the weight it's going to penetrate better. Well, the, the effects of resistance are phenomenally greater than the benefits of high FOC and high weight in general. So you run into an issue of critical mass, critical failure of not even critical mass, but critical resistance. So you can't physically force that huge point through something. Um, and then if you hit bone, now you're really, you know, against the odds on that. But, yeah. you know, there's a ton of uh, energy absorption in animal skin, especially if, if, uh, you know, when you're talking about stone that actually has a lot more surface area too, than, than metal points. So it's absorbing a lot of that moisture and it can be very hard to cram stone points through something. And when you look at the archeological record, what you notice is the true arrowheads are very, very small, the size of your fingernail for the most part, very, very light 15, you know, 
six grains up to 30 grains. Hmm. When people say, well, I found, I found an arrowhead nine times out of 10, what they're finding is an atlatl point that was on a, you know, on a spear hmm. shaft and that spear is, you know, is, you know, upwards of 3000 grains, you know, and it's being thrown by hand very, very hard. And even a lot of those yet that people find are actually knife blades or exhausted knife blades, just because they have notches in them doesn't mean they weren't hafted to a knife handle. And so we've, Mm -hmm. we've really studied a ton of that kind of stuff through the archeological record. Uh, And you have to remember too, that especially in North America, we're talking about atlatl points and knife blades being used from, you know, a couple thousand years ago, I mean, even a couple hundred years ago, quite honestly, especially knife blades is straight up until this, you know, Europeans brought metal over, um, or they started working, you know, small amounts of copper locally, but that's very isolated, but you're talking a couple hundred years going back to the first people in the Americas, which now is being shoved back further and further, 14, sometimes 16,000 years ago. So you have a lot more artifacts out there that are at lateral, you know, spear and, and knife point related than bow and arrow, where the bow and arrows, as we know it today, shooting small arrows. And this is part of my book as well, where I, I'm actually pushing the bow and arrow back to, you know, a little bit further uh, and putting some context to that. But the bow and arrows, we know it today, how people shoot with relatively light arrows, you know, small arrows, not big, long stuff like you see in the jungles. That's only around about a thousand years old. So, you know, even up, up to 2000 in some areas, but not very common. And so the amount of artifacts in the ground from 800 years ago or a thousand years ago is way less than 16,000 years worth of artifacts. So when people find these larger artifacts, they say, well, you know, this one's single, like even there, there's even beveled, single beveled uh, atlatl points. And, but it wasn't for the uh, the pen- penetration benefits like we see with the Ashby report type of stuff about cutting through bone. It was a totally different context. It was more preservation of the material, uh, you know, in the stone tool within itself rather than some sort of penetration. The things that are truly single beveled most of the times are not projectile points at all unless they're exhausted knife blades that are repurposed into projectile points. And so, unfortunately, when people do see these larger artifacts and they say, well, you know, early people knew it, too, and they were shooting this big, giant, heavy FOC stuff. Well, if you take something that's really big like that and shoot it at a deer, it's going to bounce off. Even if you shoot some of this stuff with the modern bows, it'll bounce off. But there have been people that have made some very large stone points, and then they shoot them off of either traditional bows or, you know, more modern primitive bows with a fast flight string and a long draw and they're able to shove them through there because they've got that extra energy behind it that extra power stroke and then they say see these big ones are the ones you want because they haven't tried the little ones but then once you start getting down to that threshold of failure down 150 140 especially 130 man you're going to bounce those right off of an animal in you know every single time you're not even going to penetrate so the contextually um you know, relevant arrow points are very, very small. And that's because they have very little resistance and it's like they can just pop right through the skin uh, really easily. You actually get a lot more penetration. So when it comes to primitive, true contextual primitive, a very, very small point on like a barrel tapered shaft that comes down to a very, very almost, almost like you would expect out of like a small dart rather Mm -hmm. than an arrow that penetrates exceptionally well. It's also very weak and very fragile and it can break easily. But remember that the side to side pressure is not nearly as great. It can hold a lot straight on. So even if it hits bone, most of the time it's going to either break the bone like a rib. I would say you're not going to get through a shoulder blade. Typically big, robust shoulder bones, you're not going to get through. But they hold together just long enough to get in there and do the damage. And most times do come out the other side, um, you know, unless you start getting, you know, way down into that threshold of failure. So uh, we started doing a lot of testing. Me and a friend of mine, uh, Vastin Hall, and I get to hunt his place. He's got a a great big ranch down in South Florida. He's a heck of a hunter. He really is. Um, I started making him stuff and say, here, let's go test this and just shooting hogs all year round. And he was living, living down there, just hunting, you know, wild hogs. And, uh, between him and I, and, uh, and a lot of it was him quite honestly, between him and I, within six months, I think we put something like 25 data sheets down on hogs that we've shot. Um, nice. with, 
very small stone points down to like 12 grains and even arrows that are down to like 360 grain arrows and still shooting through hogs and stuff like that. So it's like, that's a part of a new project that I really can't talk about. Cause I'm, it's, I'm, I'm hiding this one because it's <laughs> when I release the book, it's like the coup de gras for the book. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. I guess. Um, yeah. But I'm going to, I'm doing a hunt with a, a relatively light cane arrow uh, and small stone points. And, uh, you know, that'll kind of cap off the, the last of it, aside from all the data sheets on the hogs and the deer and stuff like that we've shot. So yes, it is kind of opposite as we see a normal trad with high FOC and heavy arrows. In fact, when you start getting these um, speeds too, when you're talking about the arrow speeds, um, you know, saying, well, you want to shoot a really heavy arrow so you get the better penetration. I've also seen firsthand, well, what happens is you have an arrow that, that is not traveling very fast and you're hunting off, say, like the ground or something, deer will flat get out of the way of it. So you try to shoot 15 mm. yards at a deer and that deer is gone before that arrow gets there. So there's a sweet spot there. If you try to shoot a 600 grain arrow and your bow is shooting a primitive string and it's relatively slow and you've got a, because it's super humid or you've got a short draw length, deer just don't get out of the way of it or you're going to hit them really bad and not recover them at all. So there's something to be said about, you know, a 400 grain arrow that's clipping along a little bit quicker. It's got plenty of penetration if you build it correctly uh, with a little stone point. But when you start mixing the trad and the primitive stuff, it's a recipe for disaster. And most people don't know it. They just apply what they've learned through traditional, which is great information for traditional archery and steel points. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's damning essentially when it comes to primitive. Well, it's, you know, I, I mean, I, it's, that's wild. Cause I shoot a 605 grain arrow out of my compound. I, I mean, I'm, I'm shooting 75 pounds. I have a 30 and a half inch draw length. Like I'm sending those things. And like, I couldn't even imagine somebody trying to shoot that off of a sinew string, yeah. you know, with a, with a stone point, it makes a lot of sense. You know, you think about the size of the stone point you're going to need to get that like heavy FOC, and you, you know, that surface area kind of, uh, cancel negates. negates. Yep. That's the word I was looking for. Thank you. Negates any of the benefits you'd get from that FOC. Um, so if you were going to shoot a heavier arrow, it, like you said, it feels like it would be better to have that smaller point and then more of that weight in the back to push that through. Um, it, it's interesting. You got my, my brain going. Cause I, I got, I got into it one time with a guy over heavy arrows versus, versus, light arrows and penetration and speed and momentum versus kinetic energy. And it was a, it was a whole thing. And I, I, I'm far from an expert and I, I wrote a blog blog about it from a fairly uneducated point of view, probably, but uh, it's, it's got my brain going now. It's interesting to think about. Um, so is there, you know, uh, one of the, one of the things I love is you talk about, you know, you hunt primitive, um, and that is not just within your weaponry. You know, I mean, you go out, you're not going out with a, you know, your primitive bow, but like fully sit cut out or, you know, you're not in this high end technical hunting camo. I mean, effectively you're out in solids, a t-shirt and a, a pair of pants when you're, when you're hunting, it's you, you kind of embody the whole lifestyle. It feels like. Yeah. And to me, like people that wear camouflage and hunt with primitive stuff, to, again, it's like out of context for me. It's like shooting a carbon arrow off of a primitive bow. And it's okay if that's what people want to do. Most people do that. When you consider, you know, what early man was wearing, mostly buckskin, you know, type clothing or even textiles, you know, stuff that's made, but it's made out of plant fiber. It's plant fiber cloth. That was very common, actually much more common than, than brain tan and buckskins themselves as actually early textiles. Um, but they would have, been able to also paint them and dye them to a certain degree, but it's not like the camouflage we have today. And so people that have seen me hunt and seen the shirts that I wear that I, you know, I hand paint these shirts um, and that's what I wear hunting. And, you know, it's just like a tan type of shirt or it's one that I've dyed in Osage uh, shavings and then my pants are, you know, brown to tan colored. And that's just to kind of represent that same color. Cause I want to, I want to put myself in that same um, kind of color scheme, if you will. Yeah. You know, it's it's like kind of like hunting out of a tree stand too. 
is is a bit out of context. I'm not saying early man never hunted out of trees because they they absolutely did. It was a superior way to shoot stuff, but it's not as convenient as a tree stand we have nowadays. And I've shot some deer out of standing in trees, um, but you know, wearing modern camouflage clothes and all that kind of stuff, it just doesn't fit within the context. And so it's like, I kind of want the full experience of it. And I want to show people too, that you don't have to wear camouflage. Everybody's like, well, if you don't have, you know, this stuff, you're going to get seen. And it's like, man, I'm sneaking up and, you know, literally stalking animals or ambushing them on the ground. And yes, I get busted a fair amount of times, typically more my scent than they see me unless I'm just mm-hmm. being an idiot. And I'm like, yeah, I was being an idiot. And they saw me because <laughs> that happens a fair amount too. You know, I let down my guard and I was like, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. Um, <laughs> you know, and occasionally they pick something out, but look at nature as well. Um, the way the animals eyes work are different than ours. The exception, of course, of like turkeys, you know, and, you know, birds in general. But the deer is brown for a reason. You know, it blends into nature, you know, so much better. And so our clothes, like the clothes that I wear, are very similar colored to that. In fact, there's times that when I'm hunting public land, I'm like, I'm out here in a brown, you know, shirt and brown pants walking around. And, you know, there's times that even in archery season, if there's a lot of people in, I'm going to wear orange, you know, for a little bit. (laughs) I hate the way it looks or feels. But even if I, you know, put something on that I stand out because I realize how much I match in. And then I'm also slipping through the woods very, very slow and, and being quiet. And I'm on the ground. And that's not what people expect to see out of a hunter nowadays. So I either stick to the roads or I have to wear something like I have also public land shirts that I've made that have the same color or the same paint scheme on them, but they're orange. So this way I can go out and I still have this, the color scheme. And when the animal sees it, it just looks like the Brown anyway, but this way I hopefully don't get shot. Um, but you know, I, I also, and I don't, I can't say that I know it cause I don't have, I don't know the science, but that's what I was also, um, I've heard or I've read before is that some of some animals, when the way that certain colors look to them are different than they are to us, where mm-hmm. something like, a when they look in black and white, the color brown and the color green look like the same. So the lion is the color of the way that it is because in the summertime when stuff's green or in the wet season when it's green, it is is the same color as the grass. And when the grass is dead, it's still the same color as the grass because they don't have the range of colors that we do. Mm-hmm. And so I was very, because I always kind of thought about that going, man, I bet they stick out like a sore thumb in the summertime. And then they put the same filter on that they suppose that, you know, say like the antelope has it in its eye and the color is still exactly the same that mother nature works in ways. You see some of those, I think, uh, oh man, was it David Attenborough? I've been saying that wrong, I'm sure, but he narrates a lot of these Mm -hmm. things, but there's, I think it's on, might be Netflix or YouTube, but it's something about color and nature. And it's very interesting to watch that there's like butterflies and stuff too, that have the colors on them that we can't even see that only the butterfly can see and if you look through it at their filter it's a totally different pattern than what they have we see something totally different and they go through the same thing about like leopards and lions and how they look at different times of year compared to their surroundings and mother nature's just kind of figured that out somehow and but it's outside of our scope of what we can see so you know people are like you're never going to kill anything you know walking around and you're wearing these solid (laughs) clothes people make fun of me on public land and and uh, i'm typically the one that shows up at the check station with something dead you know and then they come back mad at me you know that (laughs) because they just were making fun of me earlier i love when somebody makes fun of me on public land because i'm like today's the day i'm gonna shoot something because that's the way that typically works (laughs) It's, I mean, I know some of the best hunters I know, um, you know, and you're the only, only tra- uh, primitive hunter that I know, but some of the best hunters I know in general were solid. And it's, you know, I mean, what was it? The old Fred bear quote, the, the best camo is sit down and be still, sit down and shut up. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. I still, um, that's, that's exactly it. I'm glad, I'm glad you brought up Fred bear though. Uh, because my dad was a big Fred bear buff. Uh, and, and he was more or less like one of my idols growing up. Like I use him for a lot of inspiration, not just from hunting, but from a a way different, uh, direction as well. But, uh, my dad was from Pennsylvania, you know, and as was Fred bear. 
And so there was a little bit of connection there. And my dad loved traditional archery. So as soon as that started to become like kind of popular, he jumped in on that. And so he always shot bare bows. That's what he shot was bare recurves. And he had a, a very extensive collection in which now I've inherited, but I have, I do not have the heart to sell any of them. It's just like, I just sit on them. Most of them aren't very nice. Some of them are quite nice, but it's like, there are bows that I'll really never, ever shoot, but I just keep them because of him. And someday somebody's going to be like, wow, this is the jackpot of bears, you know, because they're going to be a million years old by the time I'm, I'm done with them or, or my kids are. Um, but when, you know, he, my dad moved to Florida, well, they moved the the plant down to Gainesville. And so my dad used to take me up to the Fred Bear Museum when oh, I was wow. really little. Now, they closed that when I was still really young, but I remember tiny bits and pieces of it. And my dad also went and uh, listened to Fred speak and then got his uh, Fred Bear's field notes signed by him, you know, at the oh, time. And I remember that my dad loved that kind of stuff. And so he used to talk about Fred Bear. And then, you know, when they came out and put his shows on DVDs, you know, that was great. We went, went, bought every one of those and watched them all and loved it. And, uh, and I loved him for how much my dad loved him. And then as I grew older, I started to really admire um, – what he did for archery in general, what he did for, especially even in traditional archery, when everybody continued to move on, he moved, he moved into the compound a little bit, but then he personally regressed right back and he kept the tradition alive with, with traditional, with the recurves. And if you look way back into the history, you know, when, when uh, Nels Grumley was building his bows and they were Osage bows, you know, uh, early on, of course, I can connect with that as well. But it's, and it's not just what he did for the archery, but it's also how he built a business around it where nowadays we look back and we're like, well, duh, that makes perfect sense. And it's like, but people back then didn't like archery. You were called like a gangrene hunter, you know, at the mm -hmm. time, because they said you couldn't kill the kill animals with this. And I can relate to that because I have heard not so much now. I think people finally get to a point of respecting me for it. People don't try to tell me that I can't do something anymore. Cause I think I've proven that now way too many times on them. <laughs> um, but I used to catch a lot of flack saying that you're just out there wounding stuff or, you know, it's stick and release, you know, as, you know, as opposed to catch and release, stick and release, you know, and, uh, you know, saying that just this stuff is bad. It should be outlawed and all of that. And I've worked very hard. Now, I'm not the only one that's worked hard to make it mainstream popular, but I've uh, I've probably got more content out there and uh I honestly more product and everything else because I've turned it into a, a larger business. And that's what. Fred Bear was able to do also was turn this into a, a very lucrative business that not only, you know, helped him and his family, but helped the industry, the mm -hmm. archery industry in general. Because if you, ha this is one of the things most people don't ever realize about how business meshes with things that you enjoy is in order to make something popular, you actually have to make quite a bit of money doing it because you can't reach a massive amount of people without quite a bit of influence. And that influence, especially in the last 50 years has been through money. If you don't have the money to put it in front of people, people can't see it. It's just the way advertising works and everything else. Now, luckily, we also live in a in a new age uh, where there is organic reach. We don't have to necessarily pay for it, but that comes at the price of you have to work extremely hard to get organic reach through social media and you know YouTube, podcasts, that kind of stuff. Um, I kind of look at what he's done with traditional archery. And, uh, I never want to be the type that says, well, I'm going to be the next Fred bear because there's only one of those. Yeah. I don't want to be the next Fred bear. I just want to be the first Ryan Gill. If that makes sense. Yeah. I want people to say, you know, maybe 50 years from now, Fred bear did this for traditional archery. Ryan Gill did this for primitive archery because they're two totally different things. And for a long time, they did get meshed together. And now I'm working hard to kind of separate those and say they do go hand in hand. But the difference between compounds and traditional is about equal between traditional and primitive. And so it's, it is kind of a totally different uh, demographic, if you will. And so that's kind of my goal is, is uh, to be essentially, for lack of a better word usage, you know, the Fred Bear of primitive hunting. And so that I've had mm -hmm. my, my goals, my eyes set on that now for, well, I bet you 20 years. And that's what I've been working towards. And I've read stuff from Fred bear, um, that most people don't even know exists, you know, about his, how 
he ran business, you know, as mm-hmm. opposed to just he goes and shoots something uh, or he worked with ABC. But when you start learning and watching like the little clips of things that's behind the scenes, there's a lot more to it. And that's that's one of the things that I respect absolutely the most about him. And probably nobody even knows that about him. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't dumb luck. Well, you know, it's interesting because it's one of those things you wouldn't think that. Like, I, like I, I get it to the extent of, you know, people are like, just don't understand it. And they're kind of like, eh, yeah, whatever. You're not going to go kill anything. But you wouldn't necessarily consider it such a controversial thing. And it's cool to see you being an advocate for something you're so passionate about um, and and representing it in such a, in a, a respectful and skilled fashion. And I mean, I'll, I'll say right out, you know, primitive hunting is not going to be for everyone. And I'm sure you'd probably agree what it, it's not going to be everyone's passion. And there's going to be people that aren't going to put in the time and the study and the work required to be ethical and Mm -hmm. uh, ethical and successful with that equipment. And if, you know, you're going to love it. Yeah. If you've only ever shot a rifle and, you know, you, you pull out your rifle, you know, uh, a few weeks before the season, you know, make sure, make sure the scope hasn't gotten knocked off site. You know, you haven't touched it since then. And, and you go out in your hunts and you harvest your animal and you call it a, you know, you call it a season. Awesome. Great for you, but you're not going to be able to do that. You're not gonna be able to do that with archery period, let alone any sort of primitive hunting. Um, you know, as you step that stuff down, you've got to have that dedication, that passion and put that work in. Yeah. There's been people that have said, you know, especially now that primitive is getting a lot more popular, you know, as we do YouTube videos and, and, you know, writing the books and, doing everything I can to get people uh, inspired to even try this. Cause a lot of people are now they're making a big switch into it. I mean, my business is the biggest that it's ever been and it grows phenomenally every year. It's, it's nearly doubled every year uh, for the last, last five years, you know, in regards to um, income and order, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's getting rather huge. In fact, now that I'm employing several people throughout the country to help, um, create product because I simply can't keep up with it. So it's growing really, really quick. And there was uh, a little bit of interest from people. I still hear it on and off, but there for a little while, especially in Florida, wanting to try to lobby to get like a primitive season, say, well, you know, bow hunting, archery season was made for people that wanted more of a challenge than the gun hunting. And so we got to go out earlier before the animals were spooked and archery hunt and say, well, now, now archery has gotten to where it's so modern. Some archery is not even archery anymore. You know, they start talking crossbows and then they start bringing in the air bow and who's, you know, where, where do you stop? What's what defines it, you know? Yeah. And so that comes down to state by state or, or, uh, you know, landowner, you know, whatever they want to allow that kind of thing. Um, you know, state rules, uh, state, Um, not the state rules, but say like a WMA state land rules, you know, all totally different. And so I've heard people say, well, they should have a primitive seasons, you know, for people that want to get out and just hunt with this. And uh, I say, absolutely not. That's about the last thing you want, because what got people as much as now it it could be good for business, you're going to sell a lot more stuff, Mm -hmm. but it's not all about the money. What it comes down to really is, and is, And I'm not a big ethical type of person. I'm efficiency. Uh, Ethics is a byproduct of efficiency. So I like to kind of step right over top of ethics and say I'm about efficiency. If you're efficient and then you're also ethical. The problems you're going to have with when you start digging into this really super primitive stuff or just a primitive season in general, even if it's including the modern bowstrings and doweled rods, arrows, you know, if it was no, no cables and pulleys and that kind of stuff, you're going to have people that will go out and buy that product. And yes, people in that industry will make a lot of money, but that's not what it's all about. You're also going to have a lot of people that are just chunking arrows at stuff because especially because they come from, you know, the mindset of the, of the uh, compound hunter where you can shoot exceptionally far and be exceptionally accurate. And there's a lot of compound hunters that say, if I am going to shoot a recurve bow, I'm, I can, I I can, I can hit a target at 50 yards. I'm going to shoot at it. And there's a lot more variables to that now than there is. And there even is with the compounds where people honestly do quite often shoot too far because while their accuracy level can be very high, it can be the best shooter in the world. The one thing that you cannot control is the reaction time 
of the animal and how fast that that animal can move. And I have personally watched people shoot deer, like family members that are phenomenal shots, shoot deer on film. And this is what we don't see on televisions because they typically don't show it if it's terrible. Like if mm-hmm. it's really bad, they don't show it. If it just yeah. moves a little and they shoot a little back or a little low or something, they'll still show it. We found it, you know, and they just kind of play it off. Like it was a little back. It was a little further back than I wanted. I have seen, a, been privy to see a ton of shots at deer at say 50 yards where the deer completely turns around. It was facing one way, turns around the other way and gets shot in the face and it may kill the deer. It may not, but that happens a lot, but TV doesn't show it because that's bad for product. Well, that's going to get even worse if you start allowing a traditional or a primitive season because people need to realistically limit themselves to honestly i say 15 yards and in if you're shooting like more modern traditional stuff you can really stretch it out to 20 maybe 25 with like lighter arrows with a higher foc on a very efficient bow that's relatively quiet but for the most part you know the last thing you'd want is to put a stick bow and stone points in the hands of people just because they want another two week season or three week season to hunt because there's going to be a hack of a lot of deer running around out there with arrows sticking in them. So I'm totally against that, but that's, that's what makes this so different, I guess, than any other form of hunting. You can go from a rifle where it, all it comes down to is accuracy or, you know, wind, you know, mm-hmm. realistically, elevation and wind. So that's the the main difference maker. And you're only going to get those super long ranges out west for the most part. And there's still people that overcome it and they practice. But how many animals get shot really bad because guys want to shoot 800 yards at stuff because they do it on TV and it's super cool. And I get it. And then you feel good when you do it. Well, it trans, you know, but you can take a guy that hunts with a rifle and the animals don't react. And then you shove them into a compound bow and it's kind of very short learning curve. You can pick it up get you a compound, but you never shot one in your life, get the sights, go to a, go to a shop and they'll set you up and tune you in. And within, you know, what, a couple of weeks, couple of months, you're, you're deadly. You, you're off and, yeah. and shooting stuff, you know, huge learning curve difference when you start dropping to traditional and then dropping down to primitive can get even, even tougher. I've got friends that shoot traditional. that are like, I have no idea how you even shoot primitive. They're like, I'm a very good traditional shot, but I can't shoot a primitive bow for anything. Mm-hmm. It's like, there's some aspects of it where some people have it and it's very, very easy for them. And then other people, they struggle with it. And so, I mean, it's, again, it's the minority, but that would be like kind of worst case scenario. If somebody says, oh, we're going to have a primitive season only. And I'd be like, oh, this is, this is bad. This is kind of <laughs> ugly. This is how you outlaw primitive hunting altogether. Is this oh, what man. <laughs> Why are we giving them extra ammo to outlaw this? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> So is there, you know, uh, as you go through all of this, is there a particular uh, culture or uh, tribe or this or that that you, that, that you tend to gravitate towards or emulate or, or do you pull a little bit from everyone and kind of have your own style? Whatever I do is uniquely me. It always has been. But now I find myself being far more influenced by say eastern united states um but that doesn't come down to a particular culture that's a that's a hot topic for people sometimes especially now in the new woke era where you we start talking <laughs> cultures and appropriation Jeez. and all that and i have to deal with quite a bit of that and actually really most of, yeah oh yeah most of the older guys like older you know indians or native and even people are like well you can't call them indians you have to call me i've never met an indian that didn't want to be called an indian they call themselves that it's they don't look at that as derogatory unless you mean it to be um but most of the older ones really like what i do and they're like hey thanks for you know bringing a lot of this back that that's a lot of it's been lost you know and and they actually like me uh, a lot of the young ones in the new uh, woke culture, you know, or like you're stealing, you know, this from me and, uh, you know, this is mine and this is racist. And it's like, it's actually the opposite of racist. What you're doing is racist, but they, you can't talk any sense to any of them. Um, so I try to my very best to stay away from any particular culture. And I certainly can't advertise anything as such because of the, uh, native American, you know, act with, you know, selling product and yeah. stuff, which I wouldn't ever want to do that anyway. Cause it doesn't really fit what I do. I'm not going to say this is a you know, a Navajo bow or a 
you know, a Cherokee bow, you know, we, if I do offer a, a bow on the website that's, you know, it's called a Cherokee inspired bow. It's an Eastern woodland style bow. And, uh, but we never misrepresent it and say that it's made by a particular tribe kind of thing. But when it comes to being influenced, um, Eastern United States probably gets me the most excited because I just live here and I see it. Uh, like even my own personal, I did the, um, the genome project with Na- National Geographic, uh, you know, back when, whenever that was, seven, eight years ago, I submitted my DNA and, and had it uh, analyzed for their project. And then they came back and, uh, and the, I, I, you know, the only thing that we ever knew was that our family came from, you know, the British Isles kind of areas, you know, England, you know, Ireland, Scotland, that kind of stuff. And then my mother's side is German, but you don't know anything very far back. And and what we actually discovered in that, which made a ton of sense, especially with a lot of um, our features that we carry or do not look incredibly Irish, like nobody else can see it, but you can. I, my beard does not look like a like, uh, you know, a, a European style beard, it looks totally different, you know? And so we actually come to find out that up until about 5,000 years ago that my, uh, paternal side, uh, was based from the Natufians, which was, is in like modern day Georgia and Turkey. And it's what they called the fertile crescent. And mm-hmm. they lived there f- for, tens of thousands of years and stayed there where a lot of people continue to move on. That was what the, they considered the birthplace of uh, uh, like civilization and, and uh, agriculture, especially agriculture. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, long story kind of short, I kind of learned quite a bit of myself about that. And I started studying some of their culture and as, as much as I was not necessarily culture, but like artifacts and that kind of stuff. But what I found out was I don't live there you know, I live here. I have a far greater connection with just, I've never been there in my life. I have no idea what it looks like outside of a picture, but I walk the land that people hunted here. I feel much more at home and uh, much more of a connection with the people that lived, especially in Florida, than anywhere else. And I don't think that that it needs to come down to a blood or a race kind of thing. It's, I think it's geographical more than anything. It's where you call home. And, uh, and although I'm not a descendant of them and I wouldn't even go as far as to say, well, I feel like I'm one in spirit because people say that kind of stuff all the time. And I'm just <laughs> like, I think that's just kind of goofy. Um, I just, this is, I just love our natural resources. And so I try to say what has, what existed here at that particular time and what can I make from that and go kill animals. It's like, I love geographically built sets. Like if I Mm -hmm. am going to hunt Florida, I want to use like agatized coral from Florida for the stone point or Florida chert. And I want to use like the native cane or the native sparkleberry for arrow shafts. And I want to use, you know, a hickory bow because that's what is, was predominantly used here. Um, And that's where I really draw my inspiration and my connection. It's not from the culture, it's from the land. And I've tried to express that to people. This is probably the best I've ever articulated that before um so hopefully the people that get aggravated with me actually get a grasp of what i'm saying this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah connection of land i think way more than culture itself and pre-columbian means way more than me and by pre-columbian that's pre-columbus so before european contact so that's where my passion is is we know a fair amount about people after europeans arrived not a ton. I mean, the more Europeans were here, the more journals they were writing, we learned more and more about them. But what we don't have information on is pre-Columbian. That just comes back to the archaeological record. And I've been exceptionally interested in that, trying to crack some of the the codes on the evolution of the bow and arrow, because it's uh, a lot of people just say, well, you know, we were throwing spears one day, and then somebody invented the bow and arrow as we know it today. And that changed everything. And, uh, I don't believe that that's the case. I've seen enough through the archeological record. I believe it was an evolution from the atlatl to where, um, the bow was a propulsion system to essentially shoot an atlatl dart or an atlatl spear. And you have a, you know, a much longer bow that's a sapling bow and you're still shooting these very, very long arrows. And that's evident today, even Hmm. in other, uh, you know, 
primitive cultures, you know, say like down in the Amazon basin, Papua New Guinea, Africa, you know, the Hadza tribe shooting very long, heavy, heavy arrows, um, very reminiscent yet of the atlatl spear shafts. And when you start looking at the points that they were making, say 3,000 years ago, there's a major shift about 3,000 to 3,500 years ago between these larger atlatl points. And they start getting the same style, but they start getting smaller and more refined. And to me, that's a shift in switching to the bow and arrow. If I can crack the code on that, that's information I want to be able to give people, you know? And of course that's kind of, you know, low key stuff because it's, it's all conjecture, you know, it's Mm -hmm. speculation. I can't, you know, can't truly prove any of that, but I'm kind of passionate about the pre-Columbian stuff a little bit more just because we don't, we know a little bit less about it. And that's less about individual culture and religious practices and ceremonial type of stuff. That stuff doesn't like really excite me. It's the, the implements themselves. It's the, I don't, you know, it's not even like pottery or um, that kind of things. I, I like all that kind of stuff. Don't get me wrong, but the bows and the arrows, like I'm a hardcore hunter at my core and I care about hunting and hunting implements. And that's why it's hunt primitive, you mm-hmm. know, not pottery primitive or, you know, <laughs> anything like that. It's, it's not, you know, it's not. And I always mm-hmm. joke when people are like, well, why do you have to go out and kill animals? And I was like, cause it's hunt primitive, not target primitive. You know, that's <laughs> <clears throat> my favorite, my favorite comeback to people, which uh, doesn't yeah. answer their question, but, <laughs> 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 but it's just like me trolling. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Awesome. Man. So I want to give you a, a quick, a uh, quick chance to talk a little bit about the business side of things and, you know, what pays the bills for you and kind of uh, give everyone a heads up about that so they can go check it out. Well, I have to have to cut that really dry. Cause man, that's a whole podcast in itself. Yeah. <laughs> I actually did a talk last night. Um, late last night, I had a, a, a talk in town here that I went and talked for an hour and a half on entrepreneurship. And I basically just, they had a whole bunch of questions listed for me. And uh, they, I don't even think he ever got to ask one question. I just stood up there and <laughs> talked for an hour and a half. And he was like, he made my job really easy. <laughs> and uh, um, I love, oddly enough, and I didn't always love business, but within the last, especially five years, I've really grown a love for it and seeing how it grows. Because as I mentioned earlier, if you can figure out how to, make money and allocate money into sharing it with more people, you can touch a lot more people. And so I've been able to uh, luckily grow a very, very successful business way past my expectations, you know, way past. Um, Definitely unequivocally the biggest primitive archery company in the world right now. I don't think there's anybody that's even remotely close to the amount of product that we put out um, and also the amount of content overall that we're able to put out between and it's not just me anymore i mean i'm still the the heart and the soul of it my wife works uh with me full time she does all the stuff behind the scenes that people don't see which is like order intake shipping um all kinds of odds and ends stuff and quite honestly it's like she's more or less in charge of the house kind of stuff i just work constantly it's like i kind of have the dream life in that sense i don't have to do laundry anymore <laughs> like that. and she's like you need you can't be doing this you have to go do the important stuff you know so she's totally backed into it and then i've got you know friends and associates that work with me as well now and we've really expanded out because i can't do it all um but yeah it's like I continue to try to grow it bigger every single year because I know the more efficient that this business is, the more I can get this in front of people and not in the sense of, I just want to put this in people's hands so they can go out and just do it. Cause I want to sell them the product. I want to teach them the right way to do it. That's why I'm writing this whole book. It's like, I'm going to make very little money on the book and it's not about the money. It's, it's about teaching people, the right stuff about it because there's such a difference between primitive and traditional. I want people to have the best information possible. And I really figured that out. I think it was round about five years ago that the only way to truly get that information to people was to give yourself a platform. You have to build a platform and that takes success and it takes money to do that. And so it's, it's all played and nobody's going to hand it to you. Like even if you have a message for no profit and you want to share it, people don't want to give it to you. 
like if I didn't work hard to build the business that I have today and the following, you wouldn't have a clue who I was to even call me up and say, Hey, do you want to be on my podcast? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's like, people aren't searching for me to say, well, maybe this guy knows something he wants to teach people. If, if you don't have something to really offer either with a platform or, you know, financially or both, it's impossible to reach people if you truly want to teach them something. So within Hunt Primitive, I always say we, we, it's my intro line to you notice all my videos is, Hey, I'm Ryan Gill with Hunt Primitive, where we entertain, educate, and inspire. It's like, I want to entertain people because that's what brings them in. You have to entertain somebody or else they're, they're not interested in learning. People go to school all the time. They don't want to go to school. They don't want to learn. So you got to entertain them first, but then while I'm entertaining them, I want to educate them. And by the time I'm done educating them, I want them to feel inspired. So that wasn't just something I came up with on a whim. It was like legitimate goals that I wrote down. And I said, I want to entertain people. That's actually the, like the one on the lowest end of the scale. I don't care about the entertaining of people. I want to educate and inspire people, but you got to entertain them first or they're not going to come to you. Mm -hmm. So I entertain people because I want to educate them. And once I'm educating them, I'm hoping that they'll be inspired to pick this up. Now, whether they get it from me or not, that's not the important part. Um, there's plenty of other people that are getting a start that are, you know, they're cheaper on their product. Honestly, I would be lying if I said that, uh, they were is good. I've spent years refining this. That's like, I know without a doubt that I built the best stuff that there is in the world because it's put into practical application every day. Um, and the warranty is way better than anybody. I mean, I'm like mm -hmm. on a bow, have you ever heard of anybody having a five year replacement warranty on a bow and then lifetime on repairs? It's like when people buy a bow for me, I want them to have the confidence mm -hmm. that they're going to have this bow the rest of their life. And if well, they especially don't with one, like a primitive bow that, you know, yeah. you would never expect that really. No, but I that's want not people... something you can do. You can just, uh, sorry to interrupt, but like, that's not something you can just industrialize. Like, it's not like, right. uh, you're not swapping out, uh, prefabbed parts and this and that for each bow necessarily. Yeah. But you know what that, what that's really all for is I want people to have a confidence in it. And not just from the business standpoint, I want them to have a confidence because if they go out and they buy a bow from somebody and maybe they, their budget is $200 and they go buy a $200 bow and it breaks, they're no longer a primitive hunter. They're going to go right back to traditional because they had a bad experience with it. I want to give people the best experience that they've ever had possible because I want them to love primitive as much as I do. And is it expensive? It is absolutely expensive. I wouldn't lie on that. And there's some people that are like, no, you're exactly where you need to be. And then there's other people that are like totally outpriced, can't afford it. But if I'm going to be able to give people the best product to give them the best experience possible, you know, this is where it's going to have to be. And I used to say for years that I wanted to give that and give it away for almost next to nothing. And then you realize that you work yourself into the absolute ground when you do that. And it's not good for your health. And you mm -hmm. also can't share it with people because you can't afford to. So it's, it's, it's all a good mesh. It's not like I'm sitting here just slamming money into the bank because I want to, you know, go out and buy a fly whip or a boat or, <laughs> you know, or a vacation house, you know, I invest way more back in to this uh, than I do. I don't go out and buy fancy stuff. I just say, let's, we'll shoot. If, you know, if, if our budget's this much this year and we did this, let's go do these more hunts so we can do more videos and share this with more people. And, uh, you know, I've got my own personal financial goals and with our family to make sure that we're set. That's important stuff. That's just being a responsible adult. But, uh, you know, overall, that's that's what we're about is truly entertainment education and inspiration i absolutely love that you know it's uh i think it's actually even my podcast description but i've always said my goal is to inform and inspire people's passions for hunting mm -hmm. the outdoors and all of that so i, I absolutely love hearing that uh, if folks want to find hunt primitive online where are they going uh pretty much huntprimitive.com or hunt primitive anywhere you type it in um what I always say is if somebody wants to learn how to do something, because I teach people for free how to do this stuff, that's the most important part. It's easy to find where to buy the product. That's huntprimitive.com. Most people want to learn how to do it, and I love teaching it. And it's and people, I don't sell DVDs or I, I mean, I sell books because it costs money to make books, but like all the in like 
video content to teach people how to do it's on youtube i believe wholeheartedly in giving the information for free if people want to support me they will and they do and that's all that i ever need out of it but if you want to learn how to do this stuff because that's where the real happiness is and it's progressional you know like you said you go from a, a gun to a compound to a trad bow to a primitive bow what happens is a lot of people say i want to build my own bow but i want to have something else to model it off of so a lot of people start and they try to make it and then they say well I want, you know, I want one I can trust first and it's progressional. Then they'll get into building it or they'll build their own bow and then they want arrows. So if they want arrows, they can trust, they can come to me and buy them, you know, and that, you know, that's how this whole system kind of works out. But YouTube hunt primitive on YouTube. So when you want to learn how to build a bow, you want to learn how to make, you know, stone points, just type in that stuff, you know, go to the the search, you know, bar on, on YouTube and be like, well, you know, how to make a bow. Well, you type that in, you're going to get 450 different people and you have no idea their credentials on any of it. Some guys just, I made my first bow in the backyard and now I'm, I'm an expert. And I'm going to teach everybody. There's a mil- there's so much of that. And nobody knows who to trust. So I always tell people, because I give the information for free, I actually don't get anything back out of it at all. I just want to truly educate people. Before you type whatever that is, write hunt primitive, all one word, hunt primitive, and then how to build a bow, how to build cane arrows. And then you're going to get my videos and you're going to be able to see ex- pretty much exactly how I do it, almost to the T, just depending on, you know, what exactly it is. Some of it I have to make a little bit more uh, user friendly. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, you know, you're not going to have this ability or this particular tool or something. So I'm like, this is how you can do it at home. And I try to keep it super simple so people can actually learn how to do it and not be like, cool, I have to go buy, you know, a thousand dollar sander to be able to do this. It's like, nope, we're going to use a draw knife and we're going to do everything by hand because that's the most important part learning how to follow the grain and then I go through and really teach them how to do it so that as opposed to sending people to my website and saying hey go buy my product send them to YouTube saying learn how to do it or Instagram you can see see a lot of product that I do on Instagram but I do I share how to like short videos on there sometimes or say hey the full videos on YouTube Um, and then on Facebook because I did a rebrand several years ago to Hunt Primitive. It used to be Gills Primitive Archery. And there's still so many people on Facebook that refer to me as Gills Primitive Archery. And so I have left it Hunt Primitive slash Gills Primitive Archery. If you go to Hunt Primitive on Facebook, that exists too, but that's just like a landing page. So you can like that one, but all the good stuff actually happens on Hunt Primitive slash Gills Primitive Archery. And uh, we have a Facebook group, the Hunt Primitive Tribe. And that's for people that either use Hunt Primitive products or make products basically off of my videos that they've used the videos for, you know, inspiration and they've created their own. And people used to send me pictures of the stuff that they made all the time. And uh, I'm like, well, I'm the only one that gets to see it. So we made a group for it. So if you make stuff, we just share it there. So this way they get shared with everybody, not just me. They can kind of use my platform to reach a lot of people. I just don't allow the sales on there. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I loved this episode. I learned a ton and I really appreciate you taking the time to to hop on. Yeah, absolutely. Very glad to. All right, y'all, that'll do it for this episode of The Wild Initiative. Make sure to check out the show notes page at thewildinitiative.com. Get links to everything we talked about in today's episode. It was really fun getting to talk to Ryan. That dude is super knowledgeable. I learned a ton in this episode. I hope you all did as well. Make sure to check out his website, his socials, all that stuff. Hunt Primitive. He's got a lot of really fantastic content if you want to learn more about uh, all of this. But y'all, that'll do it for this week. Looking forward to next time. But until then, I hope this episode inspired you to get involved, get outdoors, and plan your initiative for the wild. Thank you for listening to The Wild Initiative. Please take a moment to leave a rating and review on iTunes or Stitcher and head on over to thewildinitiative.com to get show notes, check out the blog, gear discounts, other podcasts from the Wild Initiative family, and more. 